Have you been zombified by diet? Why are you laughing, Dave, already? <laughs> because I, I know this episode. I know, I know the answer for me personally um, <laughs> will be revealed. Welcome to the Zombified Podcast, your source for fresh brains. Uh, Zombified is a production of Arizona State University and the Zombie Apocalypse Medicine Alliance. I'm your host, Athena Ectipus psychology professor at ASU and the chair of the Zombie Apocalypse Medicine Alliance. And and I am Dave Lundberg Kenrick, media outreach program manager at ASU and brain and food enthusiast. <laughs> so. What what would you would you prefer, cookies or brains? <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I was really in character for this you one. were I yes had, I had not eaten. And so um, at least we kept you from getting hangry. That's true. Uh, yeah. But I think besides that, I think it's also a really interesting episode with a lot of really good information. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So we interviewed Corey Wisner, who studies diet and nutrition. She is also at ASU, um, but she's at the downtown campus in nutrition. Uh -huh. And she just gives us the lowdown on like everything about diet from like is the food pyramids like is that really a thing like she answers that question and i really needed to know because i grew up in an era where it was like all food pyramid all the time and she and she talks a lot about that so and like just these different sort of like fad diets right like exactly that, yeah that sort of zombify us as right. well so. yes so how do we tell fact from fad right yes. in in the world of diet but maybe my favorite part of this episode is when she breaks down the caloric content of a brain and like what it's actually made of yeah that i love that it's so. really it's it's good so so i think people are going to learn a lot and they're going to switch to an all brain diet <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a fad <laughs> come eat brains <laughs> All right, uh, so let's jump right in with Corey Wisner. I know it's crazy, but it seems so logical. Try to fight it, but it's something psychological with you. Makes me act the way I do. I'm not trying to be over-analytical. Retracing time to remind myself how I Today we have an awesome guest, Corey Wiesner. Um, Corey, do uh, you know a little bit about our podcast, Zombified? A little I bit? Don't. Well, um, the whole idea of Zombified is to look at all of these forces that control our behavior, that influence us, that change us. Um, so, diet, food, it's a hugely important thing for a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? And it's something that exerts a lot of influence on our lives. So, so thanks so much for being here. And um, Dave Lundberg Henrik, my co-host, thank you for being here too. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to to hear about food zombification. So yeah. Um, so I realized, Dave, I really don't know much about your eating habits. What do you like to eat? Are you zombified by food? Oh yeah, definitely. I've like been eyeing these cookies that are like oh. over here since I sat down. Yeah, I. Uh, I was just eating I, cookies before you guys came uh, in. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I pretty much eat anything. Um, I actually do. Do you want one? Oh yes. yeah, I'll take a cookie. I, yeah, here we go. Here. Mm. You guys can hear it. Sorry, sorry, everyone on the podcast. Um, Corey, oh, oh. Man, those look super crisp. They're really delicious. Oh yeah. man. So I guess we're all these are good cookies. Zombified by, by food. Good. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I I am too. I mean, I love food. I love to eat. Um, I don't know that I'm zombified by like my diet so much though, because I don't really have a diet. I really just eat what I want to eat. But that's not necessarily how it works for all people, right? You, most people like have a diet that they feel like they should stick to. It, Corey, what's your sense of that in terms of how people, like, what are people's feelings about what they should be eating or not eating? Or do people just eat what they want to eat? I think it probably depends on the person that you're talking to. If I was in my classroom with my students, I think they'd have some pretty strong opinions about what they should and shouldn't be eating. 
and the diets that they follow. But I think the general public often has, there's a lot of misinformation. And I think that they draw on that. And then that's what leads into these dieting cycles where they feel like they're being successful and then they're not successful because they're not sustainable. And I think in terms of eating the concept of sustainability from a, a can you do this for your whole life is important to consider. Mm. Um, so a lot of diets are not really realistic in terms of like long term sticking with it. I would say no. Any fad diet, most of them are probably not going to be sustainable long term. Some that you might consider a fad diet, but are probably more mainstream. So like Weight Watchers, for example, is very open to including anything. All foods count. It's about moderation and balance. And I think those are probably the same principles that I try to stress to students and people that I talk to because it can be really debilitating when someone's like, well, I had that piece of cake. My whole day is ruined. Mm. And I, I don't agree that that's the right mentality to go through um, – your day in a week and a month or whatever you're doing. So it gets a little bit tricky. Yeah. So it's not like a all or nothing kind of thing. Like either you're on your diet and you're sticking to it and you're good, or you like cheat your diet or you break it and you're bad and the world is over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you never, you never see zombies cheat their diet though. In the movies, you never see them like grabbing a cupcake in between brains. They're very, <laughs> <laughs> they that stick they stick to their diet that pretty well. That is true. That is true. So, so um and I think the plan is that we will get to to this question of like what zombies eat and what zombies mm-hmm. diet is and what the implications are. But first we have to get through some issues about human diet, right? Like what sure. is actually good for us, what is not good for us. So so I have to ask cuz I, I I just wonder, like, what goes on with the nutritional recommendations seem to be changing all the time. Like, you know, this year eggs are good. Like, last year eggs were bad. Like, butter, I think it's great. Now some people say it's good. Some people now put butter in their coffee because that's supposedly healthy. When, like, Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, butter was, like, evil. So why do nutritional recommendations change all the time? And what should we be doing about it? I mean, what what should we do as people who are wanting to eat healthy if the recommendations are changing all the time? Oh, that is a loaded question on so <laughs> many levels. Um, you're right. The dietary guidelines change all the time, about every five to ten years, depending on what the nutrient is or if it's a whole dietary approach. Um, we used to have the diet pyramid. Now we have my plate. What about bowls? It's complicated. Um, <laughs> but I think... Wait, so is the pyramid not a thing anymore? It is not a thing. So what is this plate? I've never heard of the my plate. Uh, so that... now, instead of thinking about total number of servings of food groups that you need in a day, it's focused more on what you should be putting into a meal. I think they thought that that might be easier for all individuals, no matter what socioeconomic status or where they're at in life, could understand that. And even small children can really conceptualize what they're putting on a plate. And so half your plate is supposed to be fruits and vegetables at a meal, and then about uh, the other half you split into quarters. One quarter is meat and one quarter is grains. What if you're just eating cookies off a table. <laughs> That's a big plate. <laughs> well, it has grains and um, more grains. <laughs> so. Definitely does have some grains. And even Cookie Monster knows that cookies are a sometimes food. So that's his yes. most recent development. <laughs> that cookies are sometimes food? Yeah. So I don't he, know he about this. He also eats lots oh. of fruits and vegetables now. Yes, because he was sending a bad, yeah, bad, bad message. Yeah, a bad reputation. Yeah. Yeah. for teaching kids bad things about cookies and Wait. parents were having trouble saying no. Because of Cookie Monster? Are, are cookies not good, though? Are cookies okay? Can we eat cookies? I'm personally an advocate for grains. I think that they have a really important role in the human diet, and I think they right now, especially with the surge of paleo and ketogenic diets, Mm -hmm. um, grains are getting a really bad rap. Mm. And then there's all of the, um, like gluten intolerance and stuff, right? So people are having issues more with eating foods with grains. Why do you think that's happening? I think 
that is a complicated question, too. Mm. I think true celiac disease only affects about 1 in 300 people. But if you look at the statistics and look at how many people are going gluten-free, it's far more than that. And most mm-hmm. people aren't actually going through the clinically approved mechanisms for testing whether or not you have an intolerance or mm-hmm. celiac disease. And so that actually requires you to eat wheat. And then they check for antibodies to oh. the gluten protein from mm. wheat in your blood, which obviously if you really had celiac disease, that would be kind of a miserable experience. Right. Um, and I, along those lines, too, I think that we've had a lot of celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow who have tried to make eating gluten-free this image of health and Mm. um, in the last year some really good papers have actually come out that show that individuals who eat gluten-free have higher amounts of potentially toxic heavy metals in their urine and their blood uh, because most of the flowers are then made from other grains which have a higher uh, tendency to uptake things like arsenic and um, other other, oh, like cadmium, for example, would be another thing. And so like rice, for example, rice flour is often used to replace things that we would make from wheat. And then if you're eating those things all the time, then you also have these higher concentrations. And we don't know what it means for health yet, but it's not necessarily a good thing. And then if you have to follow that diet, that's your only option. But what about all the people who are following it without really mm. needing to follow it? So wheat is not so bad. Probably, unless you like it makes you physically sick, then you probably shouldn't eat it. But right. if you think that eating, eating gluten free is just healthier, that's probably not the case. No, that so, wouldn't be the case. Yeah. I have another general nutrition question because um, one of my student workers was telling me that an egg is as bad for you as five cigarettes. Have you heard anything about this? Um, (laughs) (laughs) that it essentially had the same level of carcinogens, which seemed hard for me to believe. What? Based on, so have you heard anything about this? Apparently there was. I have not heard the cigarette and the carcinogen comparison. Eggs for a long time have been demonized, especially for the cholesterol content. And the egg board actually did a really good job of funding a lot of research projects and, and other people got other types of money, so if you know, there's issues with where funding comes from. I know sometimes that can be a criticism of some research, but they actually found that you can eat up to five or six eggs a day, and it doesn't affect your cholesterol at all. Oh, okay. Um, and eggs, actually, if you think about it, from a nutritional standpoint, that egg is everything that you need for the potential of life. There is, in theory, like you can have this little chick developing in there and it has all of its nutrients to build all of the building blocks that it needs to be the healthiest little chick it can be. So in reality, you're getting complete protein um, and a lot of vitamins and minerals and other things that are really going to help boost growth and development. And so if you're a chicken, if you're a chicken, but then those are also (laughs) the building blocks and the things that we need to just maintain our tissues on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a really good source of um, protein um, there but is... what if the egg was laid by a chicken that smoked? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> smoked five cigarettes yeah. a day, yeah. apparently. Then what would <laughs> the net effect on health be? <laughs> it could be worse. I would have to go back to the literature and check that out. <laughs> so, so we should not start making our pancakes with cigarettes. Of, uh, yeah, no, that probably wouldn't be good. Yeah, they, they fall apart. So. <laughs> yeah, so that protein really helps to hold things together. Okay. Um, All right, so how about butter? What's the deal with butter? Oh, gosh, butter is a tricky one, too. So... For a while, you know, it was all about eating margarine, and then we found out that trans fat is actually worse than saturated fat in terms of what it does to clogging arteries and um, affecting other metabolic processes. And so now butter, which has saturated fat, is actually a better option, and most foods have kind of had the trans fat removed just because of the whole scare with that. Um, I think all fats are good in some amount. Saturated fat you should probably limit to a smaller portion of the fat that you're getting in a day. So maybe between like five and 10% of your fat intake, you don't definitely want, don't want to go over 10%. Um, but 
butter tastes great. It makes food palatable. Um, I think trying to fit it in in some ways is actually going to mean that you're going to eat less because the food you're eating actually tastes good and it is filling and you are happy when you eat it. I think that's an important thing. Like if, you know, you're trying to lose weight and all you eat is rice cakes, are you really going to be happy? Yeah. Probably not. So let's talk a little bit about diets and like where, because, you know, diets control a lot of people's behavior or they influence a lot of people's behavior, right? They, people think they should be eating something and not other stuff. And that influences, uh, I don't know, a lot of people in their, in their day-to-day lives. So where, if we just look at like dieting now, you have a lot of like, sort of the diet industry that's saying, you know, here's this diet, here's that diet. Um, how much of that is based on research and nutrition versus just like somebody's idea about what would be a nice marketable diet? I think some of those diets have some evidence to support them, but I think much of the evidence is probably cherry picked to support what they want to put out there. And and this is something that I struggle with because I'm not a business person. Obviously, I study nutrients and how the body metabolizes things for a living. A business wants to make money and a business wants to be around forever. So it seems to me that there may be some conflicts of interest in a company that has this fad diet that they've created. They want you to follow it. They want you to buy their products, but they don't want you to ever stop buying them. And I think to some extent, they probably actually expect you to fail or that the diet is going to not work. And then they have some new thing that they can roll out. And um, that's probably a very pessimistic view of the dieting business. Very delightfully cynical. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't know. And I think that this is also what makes being in the field of nutrition really hard because we keep saying the same messages over and over, like have variety in your diet, eat fruits and vegetables, get a variety of grains, you know, be open to different sorts of protein sources. And maybe, you know, you don't want to eat animal meat, but there are plenty of other sustainable options that you can go for. And, you know, it's not flashy and we're not promising you that you're going to drop five pounds in a week, which actually isn't healthy. You probably only want to drop one pound max a week if you want to have the best chances of keeping it off long term. Mm. But nobody wants to hear that because we're humans and we want quick fixes and Uh things that are like the magic bullet for things and I just think diet's not a magic bullet. So if you've got a diet product like a a diet or some you know products that you're selling associated with your diet and that makes people lose a bunch of weight in a short amount of time but it's unsustainable then you get the sort of, you know, benefit for your marketing of like, oh, these people lost this much weight and people feel like, oh, it worked. But then if it ends up actually not being sustainable, what, like people like blame themselves then instead of blaming like the product for not actually being something that's sustainable. Yeah, I think most people then turn to themselves and that's why then they try something else because they assume that whatever it was, it didn't work or they did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole market is wrong because it's not using the right approach. And it's actually making you have a bad relationship with a lot of different foods, specific nutrients, specific food groups, whether you're cutting it. You shouldn't cut out food groups. That's a diet that's just not going to last at all Mm. or get you the benefit that you're looking for. Mm. And I think in terms of if we're talking specifically about weight, once you lose weight, it's really hard to keep it off. Your metabolism changes, you kind of rewire things, and so then your weight may go back up and you are discouraged, but you're not necessarily thinking about maybe some of the other benefits that could have come from that. So maybe you were also exercising, and cardiovascularly on the inside, you're looking awesome Mm. and that's important so this there's this concept and some people in my field hate it and some people love it but this idea of fit and fat so you may not be able to lose weight because weight isn't the be-all end-all it's actually about your cardiometabolic health and is your vasculature healthy is your heart healthy you know are you avoiding developing diabetes those things are more important than your physical weight Mm -hmm. but we have so much stigma around weight that I Mm. think that gets lost in Hmm. the message. Yeah. And 
how does this whole issue of like control or being in control of your eating or diet like play in? I know for a lot of people, like having a feeling of, of being in control of their, their food intake is important. So when it comes to, you know, zombification and control, it's like, you know, what does it mean to be in control of your eating? And is that healthy? Is it not? Is there a sort of weird space where it goes from being healthy sort of control over eating to unhealthy control over eating? I think there's a lot of different scenarios wrapped up into that one question. So. <laughs> All right, well, start where we want, so. Um, so consider someone who's food insecure and gets uh, SNAP-Ed, the, the new name for food stamps. Mm. Um, you may use up all of your credits for food in the beginning of the month and you have this excess of food available to you and you eat all of it and then maybe you you know gain a little bit of weight from that but then all of a sudden you've eaten everything and you don't have any way of getting more food. Um, I think in some ways that kind of fits what you're talking about because you have this, you know, lots of food available, you're eating whatever you want and then all of a sudden you have nothing and you have to try to make ends meet. Whereas someone who has a constant uh, constant availability of food may be able to make different sorts of decisions. Are you talking about and that box of food in the corner over there by you? <laughs> 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 or the way you've eaten three nibbles of a cookie. And so it takes all my willpower not to just all finish right, I'll off. Move, I'll move the rest of these yeah. so that it so. takes a little less bandwidth <laughs> from you, Dave. So. <laughs> well, and that, that's another thing, willpower. Um, I think it's really hard when food is sitting in front of you to not eat it. Yeah. And... I, I'm going to eat it, cookie. It, <laughs> 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 and I think also like social settings and different things dictate what we eat when we eat and mm. we forget about the social aspects of food and it's not it's not just about what you eat but it's about enjoying the time with individuals so this is maybe relevant. I was just at an etiquette dinner with some of the students on the downtown campus, and we were learning about how to eat at a business dinner. And it's a it, really is this the thing that like is part of the nutrition program? No, it was oh. just a fun activity with okay. the dean and some students cool. were invited, okay. and they needed yeah. faculty to go. So I volunteered. I was like, etiquette. I could use some of that. <laughs> 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 um, but if everyone practiced good etiquette when they were eating we would eat so much less i tell mm -hmm. you my soup was so cold by the time i made it through like five spoonfuls because <laughs> you have to scoop it away from you and then like lean in and then tip the spoon back but never put the spoon in your mouth and it was a really like thick sweet potato soup and so it was just like dribbling all over my face <laughs> <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <"Hot mess." laughs> then cutting like you're supposed to put the silverware down in between each bite and you only cut exactly the piece that you can put in your mouth without being like <laughs> crazy and trying to like mow down this giant piece of food um, how about just like stabbing with a fork and then bringing the whole thing to your mouth and chewing off a piece is that all right <laughs> That would not have been okay. No? okay. So you have to fit whatever's on the fork in your mouth all at once and then put the silverware down and then that's polite society, right? Yeah. Okay, I yeah. could do that. So, um, so uh, things like that, we're always in a hurry and so we're eating on the go and it takes about 20 minutes for your stomach to tell your brain, to tell you that you are full and to stop eating. So if you're eating really fast, you've already eaten past the point of fullness and so you know thanksgiving right you have like the gluttonous like mm -hmm. post turkey like moaning and groaning you're like oh my gosh my food baby <laughs> <laughs> so but in sort of day-to-day -day life um if people aren't necessarily going to take an etiquette class are there ways they can sort of practical ways they could slow down their eating because it, it sure. sounds like you're saying slowing down the eating will help people eat more reasonable portion sizes yeah, so there's this whole movement for mindful eating now, which is about thinking about listening to your body, telling you when it's full, maybe listening to it if it's telling you that you, you know, if you have a craving, like don't deprive yourself of a craving, like eat another cookie. <laughs> and you know, eat but if you're like cookie. halfway through the 
<laughs> Dave is stealing half of Corey's cookie. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we've all been there, right? Half but I'll eat it food. mindfully. <laughs> mm. Enjoying it. It's like, do you chew? Like, sometimes we just get through it just to swallow and, like, be done. But then you're not satiated and you're not happy. So then you, like, reach for ice cream or something else and... Um, Sometimes I think this is why we started eating salads first, so that we would kind of prime ourselves to be a little bit more full before the meat mm. of the meal comes. And, like, it has a lot more calories, maybe some sauces and other things, and then you'll maybe eat less of it or take some of it home. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I grew up in a family where we were forced to clean our plate, and that's also not really a good situation either. So having family meals together where you can talk and enjoy time together and maybe dish up your own plate based on how you're feeling and you can always get more Mm -hmm. um, but not really forcing people to eat everything I think is another important thing that we could all do more of I know sometimes I just load up at the counter and then I take it and I'm like well I'm kind of full but it's already on my plate you don't want to waste I don't like wasting (laughs) (laughs) but sometimes there's a tension between not wasting and actually like eating the right amount for yourself. Oh, yeah. My mom was always like, there's a starving child in Africa. If you don't eat that, just think about how sad that is for them. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like that was, like, for all of – I don't know about you, Dave, but, like, that was part of my childhood, too. It was, like, guilt about not eating because somewhere there are people who are starving. But I I don't know. There wasn't an option of, like, giving that – to the starving child in Africa. Yeah, I always had the same. It never made sense to me. Where it's like, why are you giving it to me? Like, I clearly <laughs> don't want it. And so if this kid wants it, now I feel even worse. Like, yeah. now I'm stealing food from some starving kid that I didn't even want. So, like. <laughs> so trauma. So, yeah. <laughs> so it didn't yeah. quite work for me. Yeah. So, but. Uh, mm. So. Yeah, well, so maybe. We should have a conversation about actually what is going on globally in terms of nutrition. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. And like what are things that, you know, those of us who grew up with our parents telling us they're starving children in Africa, finish your broccoli. Like what could we actually do to help deal with the problem of food insecurity globally or even locally? Like what, what is the sort of status now of like, food insecurity in general it's oh gosh there's so many problems still across the globe I think that countries that have been struggling for a long time politically economically you see a lot of that I mean Africa has some regions that are doing fine and others that aren't and obviously we have different programs for aid and USAID does a lot to help with that, um, there are also these different foundations you can donate to, like the Heifer Foundation, where mm-hmm. you buy a cow and then they can produce milk and eventually maybe like breed the cow and get babies and mm-hmm. then meat and other things. So there are options and ways that we can all get involved. Um, mission trips and other things. Um, mm-hmm. I know that the U.S. does send a lot of food sorts of care packages over and they've really food scientists have done a great job of finding ways to make food last longer and stay fresh so like now we have like the powdered peanut butter packets Mm -hmm. that you can send and you can add water and then the peanut butter to eat or you can just eat the powder and Mm -hmm. it lasts for years and years um so there's a lot of options and ways that we can help but Mm -hmm. i don't know that we're doing all that we can yeah and then how about you know in in the u.s i mean i know that like Issues of food insecurity are a growing issue even among university students. Yeah, actually one of my colleagues is um, an expert in food insecurity and has been doing a lot with the college students at ASU and uh, very passionate. And I never would have occurred to me that that was a problem on college campuses, but Mm -hmm. it is. And whether it's for the same reasons that maybe a low-income family is food insecure, I don't know the answer to that. But I think it is important questions for us to delve yeah. into and understand and how we can best help those communities. Right, because, I mean, we really have the luxury of being like, oh, I'm feeling a craving for a cookie and I'm going to keep myself from eating it, right? Like, because we have a cookie that can be like, eat me, eat me, right? Not everybody has that. So it's kind of, 
you know, we're coming from a place of a lot of privilege to be even grappling with things like how do we have healthy eating in the face of abundance? Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Should we talk about the zombie stuff and then come yeah, back to Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, can I ask you just one more thing about, about like, craving? So what is the current thinking about, like, cravings? Because food itself, right? Like, you could say, oh, my diet is zombifying me. But, like, how about, like, the food itself? Like, is the food controlling behavior? You mentioned that it's hard to, like, not eat, like, when there's food in front of you. So, I mean, would you say that the food is itself, like, zombifying us, or? It's possible. I think everybody wants to think that sugar is zombifying us, mm. and these, uh, this idea of addiction, but for food, rather than things that we more traditionally mm -hmm. think of addiction for, like smoking and alcohol, but the... totally lost my thought there yeah so addiction to sugar like are we yeah. you know is it is like the food itself zombifying us do you want to add something to yeah it? i was also going to ask yeah. like i've heard all this talk about sort of like the microbiomes and how like what we eat changes what we crave like is that any is there truth to that i think there is a lot of truth to that and i think we're just now scratching the tip of the iceberg on how to understand and study those relationships. Um, I mean, I think microbes affect our metabolism more than we ever gave them credit for. You know, before it was always like, oh, it's just our normal flora. They're mm -hmm. just hanging out there, yeah. not doing anything. <laughs> but they're doing a lot. And they can tap into our hunger systems, our satiety systems. They right? actually they... produce hormones that right. trigger that system. Yeah. yeah, a lot of different hormones. And those travel to our brain and tell us different things. And I think this is why, and I've noticed this even about myself. Like if I eat, if I make a cake and I eat it all myself, which sometimes happens, um, <laughs> like every day that I have cake, then the cake's gone. And I'm like, have this oh, just hankering for more cake. And yeah. then after a few days of like not giving in to the hankering for more cake, it does go away. And I don't know if that's me or my gut bugs or yeah. what's telling me. I to have do the that. same thing with ice cream. Like, like, I'll get into this habit of, like, okay, it's, like, an hour after dinner, I want a little treat, and I'll have, like, a scoop of ice cream. And then the next day, I feel a little bit more like I want a scoop of ice cream. And then the next day, it's just, like, now it's time for ice cream. <laughs> and it goes on like this until the tub of ice cream is gone. And then I'm, like, oh, I'm now, like, addicted to this ice cream. Like, where's my freaking ice cream? Um, but then if I stop, like, with your cake, then it does go away. I know. It's weird, isn't it's it? It's weird, yeah. I don't, I, I, so I tried giving up carbs just completely because I'm bad at moderation, as you guys have seen, and <laughs> um, <laughs> it never, the craving never went away, you know? Like, it got mm. a little better, but even like three months later, it would still be like, I'd, I'd see when there'd be like, you know, cupcakes or whatever in the break room, mm. and I'd just be like, it's, it's tough. Mm. Um, so, but I don't know if I just yeah. didn't give it enough time. Well, you know, there's this whole thing about how fruit evolved to actually be appealing to mammals so that we would eat it and spread the seeds around, which is different from how a lot of other plants sure. evolved that we eat. Hmm. So the fruit actually evolved to be appealing to us so that we would sort of be its vector for, like, going elsewhere and growing elsewhere so maybe sugar is a little different from other things food wise because at least the way our like you know our we evolved to you know to like it because it has all these properties but a lot of sweet things also evolved to manipulate us or i mean for our own benefit right to like give us what we want mm. so i don't know maybe Maybe've there's something different about, about that way sweet things but at the same time we have so many sweet receptors on our tongue and that's one way that we can perceive whether or not something is safe to eat oftentimes sweet things are safe not mm. always but more frequently than bitter things right so and i guess if you're tasting the sugar that means it hasn't yet been consumed by microbes that might be spoiling it true yeah that's definitely true mm -hmm. so there's a lot of good things about sweet stuff but yeah is it is it unique like in terms of the way that it sort of drives people's eating behavior? Is it like, is sugar 
kind of more of a thing for like driving eating than like savory or fatty things or I think everybody has sort of a different flavor palette that they're interested in some people really like the you know the texture and the taste of fat or like other people like umami or savory things yeah but I think from just thinking about metabolism the way that I do carbohydrates are the preferred fuel source for our cells it's the easiest to metabolize and therefore the easiest to give us energy. We have to work really hard to break down fat. Mm. And protein is like you're desperate at that point and you're breaking down your protein. So do you, mm. people who are like, oh, yeah, I'm eating paleo and like they just eat meat all the time. It's not really a great fuel source. And then you have all this nitrogen in the protein that you also have to then break down and turn into urea and then pee out which is kind of hard on your kidneys Mm. so carbs are gentle they are easy to move into metabolic pathways to make atp so that we have you know we're not slugging around tired all the time um Mm. so there's a reason that dave likes carbs so much yeah i think so (laughs) (laughs) yeah i guess um i like yeah i just like to eat so everything uh, pretty much, but I do, I definitely, carbs are the, um, carbs are my biggest weakness. Carbs so. are your biggest weakness. Yes. All right. Well, so. maybe that's your gut bugs telling you, though, that they want that, too. I mean, grains have one of the most diverse profiles of dietary fibers and polyphenols, which our gut bugs love. So, in essence, if you're eating things like even this cookie, although it has a lot of sugar, it also has a lot of complex carbohydrate in the form of the flour and uh-huh. so you're kind of getting a little bit of all the good stuff so there's fiber in there there's polyphenols there's chocolate chocolate more polyphenols yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean there is also the thing of if i just eat carbs all the time i'll gain weight right and i don't really want to gain weight so there's see and that's where I don't know that we have good evidence to show that carbohydrates lead to weight gain. I think there's the, this concept of energy balance. So you have a certain number of calories that your body needs every day to maintain life and your activity level. And carbohydrates themselves actually are harder to turn into fat, which is what we kind of perceive as the things that you know make us gain weight. And... So you're actually probably, maybe you're just overeating a little bit or you're not active enough. And so finding sort of a balance between your activity and your intake and just being cognizant of how much you're eating of things, I think is probably more important than the actual source of the food. Right. That's why like when I was, well, I I guess when I gave up processed carbs, I would allow myself to eat as much fruit and veggies as I wanted. And that actually worked. I lost some weight doing that Mm -hmm. because then... I think it also led to me having to eat slower. So um. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like if you're eating a salad, it takes so much longer than if yeah. you're like eating that's a steak. True. <laughs> yeah. There's a point where it's just like not worth it anymore. It's like I just don't want to eat any more lettuce. So. <laughs> um. so so Corey, how does Dave's diet compare to a zombie diet? Mm. Oh, well, so Dave clearly likes carbs. Yeah. I think we've established that. And when it comes to zombies, I like to categorize them into two types. So there's the old school dawn of the dead, kind of like lumbering, slow zombies. And then there's sort of the modern zombie, like World War Z, where they move lightning quick and your chances of getting away are probably slim to none. Mm -hmm. So they have totally different nutritional needs is what you're saying because of these different like lifestyles that they have. I probably overthought it, but yes, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So if we start with the old school zombies that lumber along very slowly and we think back to, you know, historically we think of their primary fuel source as a brain like that's what they want to go for so they are mostly only interested in brain they'll leave the rest of the body behind because that's kind of how i am with people it's like i really just want your brain yeah yeah and that's why i'm here (laughs) 
Um, so if we break that down, you know, what's in a brain, right? So there's about 2,000 calories in one human brain. Really? Weighs... That doesn't seem like that much. I mean, that's like caloric. That's how many calories an average adult needs, or does, has that also yeah, changed? Yeah, that's a... Well, yeah. I mean, on every food package, most of the yeah. percent daily values are related back to two thousand calorie diet. So, what would be like? What would be a food like? How much? Like, what would like a In and Out burger like a double double? Oh gosh, I've never been to In and Out. Uh, so, so I guess what like is it most compared to? Burgers, yeah, what would yeah. if yeah. you were to eat a burger from a restaurant and you know where you have to like smash it down just to fit it into yeah. your mouth because they're all so giant today. You're looking at just for that burger anywhere, depending on what's on it, probably a thousand to fifteen hundred calories. I so would it's like guess. so like, it's like two, one and a half to two burgers is a brain, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that makes sense. All right. Yeah. So. All right. A fully loaded double cheeseburger with bacon. Mm. Yeah. Is equivalent to a brain. To to yeah. one calorically speaking. One plain brain with no no ketchup, brain. no <laughs> mustard. No. Just just the brain. Okay. All right. This is getting so gross. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like a lettuce wrap brain, right? So, <laughs> so. Get a little frills in there. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean you, you got peanut sauce. Have some way to eat the thing. So all right. Um, so so zombies, is it just the calories that the zombies are craving? Or are there other nutritional elements that... Uh... Well, I've thought a lot about that too. And so what's in brain is basically all fat with a little bit of protein next to no carbohydrates in a lot of cholesterol. But, but wait, isn't like, aren't sweet breads, quote, sweet? Like, so they've got to have some carbs, right? From the sugar. Wait, sweet bread? Sweet Sweet breads, like, isn't that the euphemism for brains of um, animals? They're isn't sweet. that how it's prepared, though? No, I think it's, like, actually the the sugar in the brain. I, I don't know. I've never had that. Okay. But I thought it was, like, a pie. Isn't it, like, a... I think I think it is. It might yeah, have... We'll have to look this brains. up. Yeah, we'll... So. Yeah. Brains. Um, should we breads. look it up? Let's just look it up right now. Okay, <laughs> I'll see <what> <laughs> Sweet. What's in a sweet bread? But, but maybe it's not much carbs, right? It's just like... It's about 14 grams of carb. Okay. So that's maybe the equivalent of, from the food pyramid, like one serving of carbs. So it's like it's a few of those cookies much. or something. Yeah, let's have a look. So two, two of our cookies here has 18 grams okay. of carbohydrate. All right. So a brain has about as much sugar as two cookies. Yeah. All right. So most of your calories are coming from fat. Okay. All right. So that's what the slow zombies yeah. need. Is the... And so one way to think about it is that a zombie is actually following a keto diet. And... <laughs> <laughs> And they're thin most of the time. Yeah, that's so. true. They, <laughs> they also so. have their skin hanging off. <laughs> but, you know, minor details. <laughs> but, I, you know, and I think if you compare to a human who follows a keto diet and you go and you look at the blogs and read about it, everyone talks about the keto flu. So this feeling of, like, fatigue or malaise and almost having like flu-like symptoms Whoa. when you start the keto diet. And so it's like keto zombies. Yeah, essentially. So they aren't, they don't have the proper fuel to allow themselves to have energy because fat's harder to metabolize and turn into energy. And so the things that allow your muscles to move quick are carbohydrates because you can optimize and burn the fuel much faster than fat. And so they can't move quick because they have no carbohydrate to optimize quickly. Just give them a cookie. <laughs> Just let them have a cookie. It's not on the diet. There's only one thing on the diet, and that's brains. <laughs> they remind themselves constantly. <laughs> so. But maybe they crave it because if you know you look at how a zombie moves, it's kind of disjointed, and they like have these odd kind of maybe like spasms or things so maybe they're eating it so that they can remyelinate their nervous system to keep that healthy so that they can move more effectively or maybe they want all of the signaling hormones that come from the brain maybe they want to feel happier so sure. not 
pleased with what's going on with them. I I don't know. There was a, there was a movie like that with the guy who dated Jennifer Lawrence, where he's it's like a remake of Romeo and Juliet, but with he's a zombie. Have you guys? Am I the oh, only I person who's? Oh, one. it's actually really I good. I feel like I've seen almost every zombie movie. But oh, not this that one's one. really good. Um, I'll look yeah. it up as but well. But I I mean I love this like thinking functionally about you know for a, a slow zombie. Like, why might they be eating brains? Like, what are they getting, functionally speaking, from the brain that's helping them deal with the challenging situation that they're in of being undead? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the cholesterol. So in a brain, there's actually 13,000% of your daily value of cholesterol. And cholesterol is a building block for almost every signaling hormone like serotonin and melatonin, things that make us feel better. Ooh. And so perhaps maybe there is a mechanism to deal with the pain they're feeling from their degrading flesh and wow. bodily parts. Right. They yeah. do seem pretty immune to like injury and things, right? So maybe... Yeah, maybe the brains are helping. <laughs> wow. All right, and how about the fast zombies? So, yeah, the fast zombies. So... This is my take on this. So they're moving quick, so they probably have a fuel source that they can optimize a bit more efficiently. So that would mean that they're getting carbohydrates from somewhere. And if you've you know followed through all the, the zombie movies as they've sort of evolved over the decades, um, modern zombies don't really always seem to be going for brains. In fact, they kind of hunt in hordes, and then mm -hmm. they kind of just start eating whatever part of the body they have available to them. Right. And so... Perhaps they're aware of the opportunity cost with cracking a skull and getting a brain out. Um, but a lot of them you see going for the innards. Right. And, yeah. you know, maybe ripping a limb off or something like that. And yeah. so when you think about that, um, what are the things in the abdominal cavity that they might be eating? Well, the liver is actually a predominant site for storing glycogen, which is concentrated carbohydrate. So mm. that's a good fuel source. So there's about 100 grams of glycogen in the liver. And then all of your musculature throughout the body basically houses another 400 grams of glycogen. So mm. perhaps there's some benefit to going for the midsection and the limbs because, you know, the slow zombies are going to be sitting there trying to figure out how to crack a skull open to get the brain right. while you can be getting an optimal fuel source. And there are a lot of vitamins in the central part. Like the liver is a just a mecca for vitamins and different mineral processing. So, so are the fast zombies like, give me that foie gras? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you're on a date and someone that. orders it. <laughs> <laughs> and oddly enough, carbohydrates to burn them and turn them into energy need the help of a number of B vitamins and your liver actually processes and stores quite a few of those B vitamins. So mm -hmm. then not only do you have the fuel available, you now have the keys to unlock the potential of that fuel. So the liver is actually kind of awesome. Yeah, it is. Interesting. How so, come we like don't, I mean, it's, it's huge too, right? It's like yeah. half of your abdomen, or I mean, maybe not that much, but it's big. And big, yeah. we hardly ever talk about it or hear about it when we think of organs inside us it's always like the heart and the lungs because they're like so dynamic and doing stuff but the liver's just like sitting there i feel like most people just kind of view the liver as sort of a filter but it's so much more it produces i mean the krebs cycle which is how we make energy is just a prolific thing that's going on there we're making lots and lots of atp um it helps to make bile so that we can emulsify and absorb fats it um processes a number of different blood-related pathways. Um, and it can, like, dynamically get bigger or smaller, right, depending on yeah. its use. So, yeah. and it's actually one of the few parts of our bodies that if you were to lose a little part of it, it could actually regenerate itself, which is kind of cool because humans don't really do very much in the regeneration sector. Right. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So. Yeah. Why is liver fallen out of fashion as a thing to eat? Like not human mm. liver, but I feel like my mom's. <laughs> <tried to play>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know when I watched uh, was the Silence of the Lambs, and he ate liver. Now nobody eats liver. Uh, no, but before that, I like liver. Do you? But okay, I also like brains, so you know. <laughs> um, do you actually eat brains? No, no, okay. but I just I like people's brains gotcha yeah but i i don't know i feel like maybe maybe it was just 
my household. I felt like I know my mom's mom would always make her eat liver. Mm. And it seemed like it was a thing of that generation. And now I don't feel like I ever see people eat liver. Yeah. Culturally, we used, like a long, long time ago, we did eat organ meat. And actually, organ meat is such a good source of so many nutrients. It's where we store a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And now we just eat muscle tissue, which actually stores less of most things, so mm. it's actually not the best source of vitamins and minerals. And so if mm. you think about the Inuit populations that do eat organ meat, they can get almost all their vitamins and minerals just from eating organs. And then I think this is also why we are you know, now so reliant on supplements, because we have to work that much harder to get what we need. And why it fell out of fashion, I don't know. I personally don't care for the taste of liver. I think it tastes like an iron rod, but <laughs> that's mm -hmm. just me. Maybe I've never had it prepared right. And I definitely like pate though, and I know that has ground up liver. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. and that makes me feel all French and fancy. And I guess. <laughs> There's some benefits. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's actually why we started. I think my mom hated the taste of liver mm -hmm. as well, and that's why she never cooked it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I've heard it's really healthy, but I'd like yeah. never eat it. So, so just to get the like appropriate comparative perspective here too, I know that you also have done some work on vampire nutritional needs. So how do zombies compare to vampires? Oh, yes. So... Um, so we talked about zombies and the two potential types of zombies. And so they're, you know, fueled primarily from either maybe some glycogen and fat and protein versus fat, mostly. Vampires, again, vampires, I think, have evolved over time. And we have vampires <laughs> who drain entire human bodies. And then we have vampires who maybe only need a couple tablespoons of blood here and there to subsist. And they can actually eat other foods along with that. And so thinking about what is in blood that a vampire might need. Mm -hmm. um, and this isn't actually like that far from some aspects of reality. I mean, humans don't typically drink other humans' bloods, but, you know, there are blood transfusions which happen. So people get blood from other humans. It goes directly into their bloodstream. And there are a lot of human populations that consume animal blood as a regular part of their diet in fact a huge part of their diet right so oh, like yeah definitely yeah so blood is is a thing that organisms will take from other organisms for various reasons mm -hmm. <laughs> and not just vampires <laughs> <laughs> um so things that are in blood i mean you do have some fat um, you have proteins. There are a lot of proteins that float around and carry different metabolites from cell to cell. Um, it has a little bit of carbohydrate, maybe six grams in a whole human body, because our goal is to get, it's just a super highway of traveling mm. from the gut where we absorb it, and then we want to get it into the cells where things actually happen. So the blood's not really a source of massive amounts of carbohydrate. Actually, if that were the case, you'd be eating a diabetic, and then you know, hmm. that's a whole other story. So how does the sugar get from, you know, our digestive system to all the places in our body where it can, you know, to our muscles where it can do stuff? It, through the blood, presumably. Mm -hmm. you know? Yep. But it's just a little at a time. Yeah, so we have proteins that line the gut called glucose transporters, or there's glute one, two, three, mm -hmm. four, and so on. And those are upregulated when we eat sugar, and they mobilize themselves and put them into the outer membrane of the cells, and then that allows glucose to start to move over into the blood. And then the glucose floats around in the blood, and cells put out receptors and grab it and take it in. And same glucose transporters that are in the intestine, they're just moving in a different direction. Rather than okay. into the body, they're moving into a cell. Okay. And then cells do their thing with them, mm. usually travels into the mitochondria, and then that's where the Krebs cycle happens. But generally, we don't really want glucose to just be floating around in the blood. Actually, if you saw high concentrations, that would be indicative of a problem like diabetes because that means that your cells aren't able to take up mm -hmm. the glucose. Right, and if you have a bunch of sugar floating around in your blood too, you can get bacterial growth, right? Like, Because there's bacteria not in super high concentrations, but there's always like some there. And yeah, if there's right, sugar, then true. they can like bloom and go crazy and so would so would vampires benefit from eating diabetics in terms of getting a more well-rounded <laughs> diet i don't 
don't know. I never really thought about what they need for fuel more than as why I've thought about why they need to eat blood. And there are really interesting um, iron regulatory proteins that manage how much iron comes in through our intestine, how much iron goes into our cells, and then how much we excrete on a daily basis. And there's a condition called hemochromatosis where people have basically like iron overload where their body can't get rid of excess iron and I would suspect that a vampire that drains whole humans would basically have the opposite of hemochromatosis where they can't maintain their iron levels Mm. and iron is needed to carry oxygen throughout the body they're just like super anemic yeah, that's why they that's why they sleep all day. Pale, <laughs> so. and, like, sensitive to light. <laughs> so. It's all starting to make sense. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> um, so it's just like contagious anemia. Yeah. So, um, hmm. um, all right. So um, we've already talked a little bit about like. Um, well, is there anything else about va- vampires and zombies that you want to tell us before and their nutritional needs before we kind of go on? Not that I can think of right now. Okay. All right. Great. So um, we always kind of, well, do you, before we go to our last question, is there anything you want to? No. Yeah? No, yeah? I think okay, that's good. Right. So we always ask about the apocalypse because, you know, zombies, apocalypse. Mm, yes. And so what is like the, the diet apocalypse in terms of like if we as humans were so like controlled by food or by diets like what's like the worst case scenario of like the effect of food and diets on us like ramping way up like what what would happen in the world do you want to add anything dave to that no i think that sounds i think that's good what do you think so let me make sure i understand the question are we trying to survive a zombie apocalypse Uh, with food or we could certainly talk about that too. So the, the, this first question. Actually, yeah, before we go to this question, yeah, yeah, okay, I have one right, other right. sort of question about Excellent. zombies. Okay. Right. So one thing about zombies is they seem to just be obsessed with food, right? They're ignoring all sort of social motives and things like that to just eat. Do you have any theories on why that would be? Is it just... Well, if their metabolism is deranged in some way it's kind of like the maybe the whole theory of you know you put your oxygen mask on the airplane on yourself first before (laughs) other people and maybe they're just always in this state of trying to maintain their own health they don't really have time for social Mm. aspects like sharing yeah Yeah. Mm. it's a shame so. (laughs) Um. so why why are they in hordes i guess this is another question right so Presumably, they'd be able to get more meat from uh, their kill if they hunt by themselves as opposed to in hordes. But is there some benefit to being in a group if you're a zombie that outweighs the Mm -hmm. competition over the food sources, i.e. human bodies? (laughs) Maybe they're like a pack of hyenas. And then they're all just kind of like, well, if he's going somewhere, he's going to find something, and then I'll maybe get a little bit, and Mm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's probably easier to take down humans when there's a large group, too, because, one, that's terrifying, Mm -hmm. and then people don't always make the best judgment calls when they're freaking out, Mm -hmm. and... You know, it's like a squirrel, right? You're driving down the road, and then the squirrel runs in front of the car. They always run the wrong way, and then they get hit. Maybe zombies, <laughs> like humans know, or the zombies know that humans are just going to run the wrong way, <laughs> and they're going to trip and fall, and then inevitably there will be a feast. Yeah. It's true. Plus then you do get some social aspect, because you're all eating together, so that's, that's nice. True. So. Yeah. Well, but eating together, as we heard earlier, can sometimes help to modulate your eating behavior so you eat more appropriately, right? Yeah, that's true. So, so do zombies eat better in groups than they do <laughs> alone? Do they eat more mindfully? Is do, they, really, do, they, do they like tip the soup spoon instead of putting it in their mouth? If they're zombie, et- what, what would zombie etiquette be anyway for like eating in a, in a crowd? 
I don't know. Maybe the opposite of what human etiquette should be. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. So, so we know all about now. I, I'm really glad that I have a full understanding of the nutritional needs of zombies because that, I mean, if we do have a zombie apocalypse, like perhaps we could provide the zombies with their needed nutritional supplements in some sort of form that is not a human brain, right? Like, could we like sure. put it into like a, maybe not a pill, but maybe like some sort of block like here's your your brain ration for the day or brain like substance ration could we like grow brain specifically to feed to zombies because we're like growing meat now right yeah yeah so i don't see why we couldn't okay. grow something that resembles brain tissue and i mean the whole concept of true blood was a blood drink for vampires so why not make something for the zombies and we were talking about, you know, businesses wanting to maintain their profits. Well, they'd inevitably have a profit forever because they would be so reliant on this brain replacement meal. So, I mean, I think, I the think BRE. Idea. <laughs> or BRM. So, so what would be a good uh, brain substitute? Like what food has the same sort of amounts of fat if, if we were going to... Not grow it in a mad science lab? Yeah, like if because I imagine it's expensive to grow brains, but is there Probably, some yeah. other? Could we just give them big vats of butter or something? Like if they really just want fat or Maybe. lard? I wonder if you could take the individual components and then mix it with you know like some gelatin. You could even put it in a brain mold if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have this gelatinous thing with all the independent nutrients added in. So, I mean, if you think about animal research, this is how they make animal diets. It's just pelletized food from the raw ingredients all added together, maybe mm -hmm. with a little bit of flavor. I think the one thing that would be hard was getting all the, the brain hormones in there and keeping right, them right. stable. So, I mean, because I usually, I, I have to admit, I'm not like a zombie movie aficionado, but I rarely see zombies eating brains of non-humans, Right. They're yeah. going for the human brain. So that suggests that the signaling, the hormones, like all of that might be a really important part of what they're going for. Yeah. You can't just feed them a animal, a non-human animal brain and be like, there's your brain. And then there's the show Eye Zombie where she eats the brain and then can take on like personality traits and like the <laughs> memories of the person. Maybe they're interested in our memories because they want to have oh. contact to humans. I don't know. Mm. Mm. Right. So all of getting all of our all of our signaling molecules and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right. I love how we've gone so science fiction right now. So we're gonna go a little <laughs> further. Science fiction. So so what would happen to all of us in the world if we take like how how much of an effect food has on us now? or dieting has on us, like these ways that food and diet influence us. And we just ramped it up with like, you know, an order of magnitude higher influence that food has on us. Like, I, I mean, I guess for one, we'd be like all over that box of food in the corner, right? Like just stuffing our faces or Dave would, and we'd probably be like, okay, Dave, we're just going to let you go for it. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't have a big enough lunch today. I think it may have been, may have been part of the issue. Okay. So I may, I may never have a big enough lunch. I may just always be. Okay. All right. Uh, well, like, um, but I like so cookies. <laughs> so. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. You know, there's sometimes food. So, so, so like if we take that, you know, that influence that food has and that diet has on us and we just amplify it, like what happens to the world? I think the highs would be really high and the lows would be really low. <laughs> <laughs> like what are we, are we all just like eating? But no, I mean, not everybody always wants to eat all the time. Right, but I don't know. I, I, I can't even really imagine what exactly it would be other than maybe for a little while everybody would be just eating so, lots of chocolate cake and cheesecake and stuff like that. So that's a good question because, like, if I were to just totally just be like, I am going to just eat all the food I see all the time, right? Because I think I could for a while. Okay. 
I guess at some point I'd start to get sick, right? I would like... I think, yeah, it'd be like in the movie, or the, well, it was a documentary, The Super Size Me, where he kept supersizing his meals and then was like... Oh, yeah. Throwing yeah. up because he couldn't eat all the food and... Yeah. Yeah, I think eventually you would just feel gross and yucky and you might actually crave like a sprig of broccoli or something. Maybe. So, so basically, <laughs> even if we just threw sort of social constraints to the wind, mm -hmm. eventually our body would have yeah. mechanisms that would sort of kick in to keep us from just but what, eating so, all the but time. But what if we, like, just ramp up all of the, like, craving systems and everything, like, way, way up? So, I mean, maybe eventually that would kick in, but, like, what else would happen before it did, like, to society? If, every, if this happens to everybody, everybody if everybody suddenly is, everybody is just eating yeah. everything they can eat. Mm, or that they want to eat. Like, you'd have to, like, say, okay... Here's your baseline for like what kinds of foods you like to eat, how you like to eat, when you like to eat, and then you just turn it all way up. So, so I mean, some people would be eating way more than other people too, right? Because some people have more cravings in general. Some people have them under control, right? And some people just don't have as many cravings. Is there a plentiful supply of food in this situation? I think it's with the current supply, right? That's yeah. what you're talking about. Or yeah, no? yeah. So. Oh, that we would could run out of food. We could maybe, yeah, if it was guaranteed to be around forever, and then maybe all it the be. vending machines would be empty, <laughs> <laughs> except the ones with lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. so we'd have like a, you know, like the food supply would be super short, at least like for snack foods that people tend to crave, and then like. The vegetable aisle and fruit aisle would still be, like, okay. So people would eventually end up in those aisles after they ate all the cookies and junk food. Or, or would we all just be sick at that point? And, and so then nobody's... Yeah. Right. And, if I mean, if everybody's, like, just eating and eating, like, then maybe people aren't going to work, including people who are making it so that we have a food supply. And that could get dangerous. That sounds like a slippery slope. <laughs> well, and then, like, anybody who's making foods that are snack foods, they'd probably eat them before they can even get to the grocery store or 7-Eleven or whatever. So how long would it be before we resorted to cannibalism? Like... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Maybe, maybe two weeks? I would hope it would be longer than that, but I don't know. I'll lock myself in here with my stash in the corner. And <laughs> 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 or if you're unaffected, then you could just go for all the fruits and veggies while That's everyone right. else is going for their vice foods. Yeah. And then you could hoard them, too, mm -hmm. and get out unscathed because they'd be like, oh, she only has an apple. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Where are my ho-hos? <laughs> Yeah. All right. So there would be some sort of a potentially a, a breakdown of our like food supply of snack foods. Is that sort of the consensus for the food it, apocalypse? That's possible for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm not sure that people would be overdoing it on the fresh and healthy stuff. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what's sort of the ideal mutualism? scenario between us and food what do you think like because we've talked in other little podcasts about sort of rather than paris paris city sort of relationships more sort of symbiotic ones so do you think um do you think it's the food plate you were talking about people just how do we that? live in harmony with our food yeah exactly <laughs> living in harmony with our food might or eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps maybe going back to our roots in terms of agriculture. Like potatoes? And, yeah, maybe, yeah, some <laughs> potatoes. And, roots, sorry. Um, well, and I think that maybe this goes back to our gut microbiome, too. You know, they're, they crave certain things that a healthy microbiome craves things that most humans don't do a great job of eating, which are dietary fibers, polyphenols, things that come from plants. Cookies. Things that come from cookies. 
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe taking the view of what can I provide for myself or get from a store that is going to feed me, but also feed them. So if we know that half our plate is supposed to be fruits and vegetables and then a quarter grains, those are all coming from the earth in some way. And maybe the less processed, the better. But I mean, I purposely try to eat processed foods just to prove to people that you can be healthy and still have some processed food. So, I mean, I really like granola bars and things that probably have a lot of added sugar, but I don't eat them all the time. Um, but there's also a lot of fiber in there and other things that my gut Wait, loves so, like. So you're like giving us the example of granola bars as like the junk food that you eat. Oh, well, of, no, no, I can't okay. even think of like things that I, I do. I really like cookies actually. So the law school downtown uh -huh. has the best cookies ever. They're the perfect, like chewy mm. but like crunchy outside but you know when you get like the grittiness from the sugar in the cookie mm. oh my gosh so good all right good. so that's my vice and okay. i eat well, them and all. you also make delicious brownies yeah i, I know like because i've too. eaten them they're so good <laughs> yeah sorry dave so okay. <laughs> <laughs> i guess i don't consider those as processed though mm-hmm because they're always, like, from a bakery, so maybe they don't have as many preservatives and, like, other things. I right. know there's a lot of fear of preservatives, but uh -huh. they actually serve a pretty important function in the food market and our ability to actually have food available to us. So sometimes it's a little bit of a conundrum, mm -hmm. balancing all of the competing forces that affect our food environment. But Right. Yeah, so if there's, you know, one thing that we can do to kind of regain that positive kind of control over our eating like that sort of intentional like I'm eating this because it's something that I'm deciding to do as opposed to like I'm eating this because it's in front of me and I can't help myself like is there a piece of advice or a approach that you would recommend to people I think probably the first thing I would say is eat breakfast every day because if you have a good breakfast, you kickstart your metabolism and you're on a good foot that where you're less likely to have cravings later in the day because you got things started on the right foot. So what's a good breakfast? What's an example of a good breakfast? You know, honestly, I think the literature shows that just eating something of substantial caloric content. So like, don't just eat a piece of fruit. Maybe have fruit with something that has a little bit of fat and grains and protein in it so that you're kind of getting all of the major macronutrients. Um, there was a study, I think, when I was in grad school, actually, that compared a more standard breakfast of, like, cereal and milk to eating a piece of chocolate cake for breakfast. And, of course, you can imagine the media headlines, eat cake for breakfast. But... Mm. What they found was that people ate less throughout the day, regardless of what they ate, and they were matched for caloric content. So mm. it's not like they were getting more from the cake than they were the cereal and the milk. But either way, it was just the act of eating first thing in the morning and the spacing out your meals and not grazing, you know, mm. maybe all day. Sometimes you lose track of, like, what you're actually putting in your mouth. So, like, having designated time of, like, this is my schedule, this is when I eat, and Invite other people to eat with you. Spend time talking and enjoying the social aspects that food can provide for us of bringing people together. Um, I think that's often missed. You know, now we like eating a Big Mac or driving down the road to get like little Susie to soccer or whatever it is that we're doing. And we forget that food is embedded in culture too. And it is so important for bringing communities together. Like potlucks and picnics and all these things that people don't always do anymore mm -hmm. and I think the social aspects have a really important role and then just focusing on variety you know if you look at your plate and it's all brown it's probably not a good sign for your overall health in the long run so maybe like just focus on adding a new color every once in a while and eventually before you know it your plate will be a rainbow and then that's when you but pretty much you do want it awesome to be job. like a natural color not like oh just, right just add, yeah. just add a bunch of skittles <laughs> <laughs> all right so if so it's better to eat chocolate cake for breakfast than nothing probably yeah 
I think it's just the act of eating something and getting your body going. And then eat with other people instead of by yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. Those seem like totally doable things to me. Yeah. I'm going to try it. I just need to try go eating get some breakfast. chocolate cake. Because so. I, actually, I actually do eat. I do, I've been just eating fruit in the mornings. And then I'm, I'm hungry throughout the day. Mm. So I'm going to try eating a more substantial breakfast. So I'll probably start with like oatmeal instead of. Oh, yeah. But, you can put the fruit in the oatmeal. Yep. And Ooh, then, but then I won't have, will that have enough fat? It has, I put milk in the oatmeal. So, yeah, that's all right. good. Okay. So, all right. You could add some so. butter. <laughs> I, you know, I've had oatmeal with butter is really delicious. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, um, so the butter and coffee thing, like, is that, a, why, why that? Why do people put butter in coffee? Is bulletproof coffee? Is it, this is just like a fat. It's a part of the keto diet. Oh, okay. That's like their breakfast. They get, get in their fat. calories, but yeah. also... I just can't imagine what that does to your GI system. Yeah. Like, you're lubing it up with the butter, and then you just consumed caffeine in the coffee, which is a gastric irritant. So, it's <laughs> cool. Would it yeah. be a good idea? But the rest of you so happy because <laughs> you've got butter and coffee, and what more do you want? Should so. we be feeding that, like, bulletproof coffee to zombies if in the case of a zombie apocalypse? I don't know that I'd want to caffeinate them. I'd get maybe decaf with the butter, but they okay. might like the butter. Yeah, I'm just thinking <laughs> strategy for. I mean that that might be the difference books. between the old zombies and the new zombies is they mm. switched away from decaf. Yeah. So. Right, or maybe they're eating humans that have overdone it on energy drinks. I don't know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> lots of options there. <laughs> well, Corey, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so. Thanks, Dave. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> and thanks, Athena, for providing us with cookies. So. Oh, you're most welcome. So, all, right. all right. And if the whole world says that we're crazy, we don't need nobody anyhow. But if you don't want to fall in love, you better tell me right now. And if the whole world says that we're you to the Department of Psychology and to ASU for helping to make this podcast possible. Thank you to the President's Office for supporting the Interdisciplinary Cooperation Initiative and to the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics for really just supporting everything zombie, which is so awesome. Thanks to my lab, the Actipus Lab, also known as the Cooperation and Conflict Lab, for helping with this podcast in so many ways. I can't even name them. And thanks to the Zombie Apocalypse Medicine Alliance for helping to support this podcast as well. If you are looking for us on social media, we're on Twitter and Instagram as Zombified Pod. And on Patreon, we are Zombified. Our website is zombified.org. Thanks to Tal Ram for doing the sound for the podcast and to Neil Smith for the awesome illustrations for the podcast. We are so lucky to have your brains helping to make this podcast awesome. So thank you to all of you and to everyone who has ever shared their brains with me. I love brains and I love sharing and so sharing brains is like the best thing for me. So um, I'm going to reciprocate and share my brains. So at the end of every episode, I offer something from my brain, whether it's a story or a wild speculation about something or a connection to my work. Um, and so today for the 
episode about diet and zombification, I have to mention a few little things about my work. And um, I also want to say this whole thing about whether cravings are microbially driven. Um, we're going to have a whole episode where we talk about that for a lot of the episode um, with Joe Alcock um, coming up. And so that is super exciting. And um, yeah, so the connection to my work is actually me and Joe Alcock and Carlo Maley. We published paper a couple of years ago where we really put together this idea that microbes are under selective pressure to manipulate their hosts to eat stuff that's good for them and maybe even eat stuff that is bad for their competitors. So if you think about it from the perspective of the microbe, they are under selective pressure to manipulate us. Now, whether they actually evolve to tap into our nervous systems in order to do this, or it's just sort of a, a happy byproduct of other things, we don't really know yet. But the fact is, they have a lot of ways of tapping into our nervous system, for example, through our vagus nerve. They also can change our taste receptors. They can produce toxins that alter our moods. Um, they can even produce analogs of neurotransmitters and hunger and satiety hormones. So, so they've got a lot of ways of pushing our buttons. And they also have an evolutionary motive to potentially be changing our eating behavior for their benefit. So, so that is the connection to my work that I wanted to mention. But I also want to mention just um, a wild speculation, which is those of you who know me, um, you know that I am really into fermenting stuff. I started with kombucha and then started doing sourdough and then started pickling and now I've started making yogurt. Um, and so, yeah, but the thing is I just said I make them, but I don't actually make them. The microbes make them. I just feed the microbes that make them. And so I've wondered, and this is completely and totally wild speculation, but is it possible that the microbes are actually contributing in some way to me wanting to make the foods because that involves me feeding them, right? So even though it's not like me feeding them inside my body, like it might be with like a cravings explanation, it's still me feeding them, me feeding them outside my body. So, you know, is it possible that maybe they have some effect on my behavior and my motivation, like from outside my body, right? Like, could it be that they're releasing some sort of factors that I'm, you know, picking up on with like my chemoreceptors, like, you know, my sense of smell um, or my taste when I'm eating them? Are they tapping into my reward system? somehow. Anyway, that's my wild speculation for the episode. So <laughs> thank you for listening to Zombified, your source for fresh brains. It's crazy, but it seems so logical. I can't deny that there is something supernatural with